Well, my name is Preston Manning. I've been involved in trying to politically realign conservatism in the federal political field. And I was involved as a founder of the Reform Party of Canada, the Canadian Alliance, which were the predecessors to the Conservative Party of Canada. Well, November 1987 was the founding convention of the Reform Party of Canada. It actually followed a, a previous meeting in Vancouver in May where uh, we assembled a relatively small group of Westerners who were discontent with the state of federal uh, politics. The West was increasingly alienated from both the traditional parties, the Liberals partly because of the uh, National Energy Program, which took a hundred billion dollars worth of wealth from the West and transferred it to consuming provinces and the federal government, but also disillusionment with the uh, uh, Mulroney administration, partly because uh, not enough emphasis on Western concerns and uh, not enough fiscal responsibility. So we had this uh, conference at which uh, a number of options were presented. We developed a, a Western agenda, what would the West want? But then we asked the question, what's the best vehicle to pursue it? Is it to work through an existing party? And there were people that argued that. Was it through creating a, a new interest group or pressure group? Or what about creating a, a new political party? Because that's very much in the West's tradition. The West had produced the Progressive Party, the CCF, the Social Credit. So it's not a foreign concept. And after considerable discussion, it was decided, why not create a new uh, principled uh, party, federal party, uh, based in uh, Western Canada. And then that convention in November of that year was the founding convention of that uh, party. The bigger context of all this was this Western alienation, that the uh, West disillusioned with the traditional parties uh, and uh, wanting to do something different. And, and the, the general indifference of both those parties to that aspiration, that was kind of what fed the, but uh, the majority of the people who would have joined and formed the Reform Party would have come from the, the old the Progressive Conservative Party. I think it's a f feature of, the, uh, of virtually every political party that uh, if, if it wants to be relevant to its particular uh, time, that there, there's a, an evolutionary development of political parties that from, there, and there's periodic periods when they have to change from what they were in order to address the current problems or to have a future. And, and with respect to conservatism, this goes way back to old Edmund Burke, the British parliamentarian who was opposed to radical change like the French Revolution, but who argued that conservatism, and he was a great articulator of conservatism, had to be uh, in, undergo uh, systematic correction. Now, I use the word reform, but it had to change. And, and you see that in the history of the conservative movement in Canada. Sir John A. Macdonald's original conservative party had to adjust and become, uh, uh, create a coalition, get into bed with the Reform Party of Upper Canada in order to create confederation. The, uh, in the 20s and 30s, the conservative party of that time had to adjust to the progressive agrarian populism of the Progressive Party. That's where the name, adjective progressive, got attached to uh, the Conservative Party. And uh, then we, we argued that in the 1980s you had this same sort of thing, that there, there was this evolutionary necessity to change the, uh, the vehicle uh, and uh, its expression in order to conserve and advance certain conservative uh, principles. So I think this is a this political realignment or reform should not be seen as an eccentric thing or a one-off thing. It's a fundamental characteristic of political evolution of, of conservatism in the country. And we were the sort of the latest expression of that, uh, the reform, the alliance, and then the creation of the Conservative Party of Canada. And the old Conservative Party had to be, in a sense, be taken apart and then put back together. But we put it together, we felt, on a somewhat different foundation, a more Western-based foundation, and a more fiscally responsible foundation. By taking apart the old, old Progressive Conservative Party, that you had this vote-splitting uh, phenomena, which, uh, of course, concerned them, but concerned us. In the 1993 election, we, uh, there, there was uh, probably a hundred seats where the vote-splitting ended up turning the seat over to the uh, Liberals. Uh, in, in Edmonton, we lost three seats by, in 1993, by 327 votes. 
mainly because it was split between conservatives and reformers. There was enough votes there to take the seat. The fact that we didn't win those three seats meant that the Bloc Quebecois with the success, succession agenda was the official opposition instead of a federalist party. So, so vote splitting can be extremely serious, even in small numbers of 300 uh, some uh, people. But uh, we, we felt it was a necessary step in order to reconstruct the uh, conservatism on a different foundation. And eventually it was brought back together. Uh, I, I think one of the challenges, reform initially would have been seen as a, as a protest party, a, as all the other previous Western parties were a protest party. But the, the challenge is to then eventually change a protest party into an actual um, constructive uh, force. And, and that, that was part of the transition that reform had to go through, say, between 1993 and 1997. The hierarchy was, of course, just vehemently opposed to this. Uh, e even when reform started in Vancouver, I wrote to Prime Minister Mulroney and said, like, th there's unrest out here. And uh, I, I suggested that we're going to have this conference. One of the options is, can these concerns be dealt with through an existing party? Uh, why don't you send your best person to argue that the Conservative Party, Federal Conservative, Progressive Conservative Party, could still be the vehicle? And I even suggested that Don Mazinkowski, his uh, uh, finance minister and deputy prime minister, who was highly respected in the West, highly respected by herself, would maybe be the best one to make that case. But uh, Mulroney wrote back saying that uh, you people have decided to create a new party anyway. You've already, this isn't an open question, that's just a facade. And uh, he not only declined to send anybody, he forbid his MPs to come to that uh, meeting. A, a few of them managed to come anyway. But uh, so th there was no sympathy from the hierarchy of the Progressive Conservative Party, but there was a lot of sympathy among the members, because that's what we were getting the members. We were, uh, and a lot of them would make, like Stan Waters, who became our first elected senators. He was a prominent conservative here in Calgary and Stan's thing was, I didn't leave my party, my party left me, that's why I'm here. So uh, a, l a lot of that was um, disillusioned conservatives themselves looking for a new, a new home. They weren't abandoning conservative principles, they were abandoning the, the vehicle in which those were expressed. Well, uh, I had a faith, like I've, I've been a student of these uh, Western movements and the, the West has done this time and time uh, again and, and with, with considerable success. The, the old Progressive Party became the, actually had the second largest number of seats in the House of Commons in 1921. They forced the Liberals to adopt um, freer trade uh, uh, principles, uh, fairer freight rates. They lent their name to the Conservatives. The, the CCF and Social Credit, which were depression parties, uh, both had long lives and successful administration provincially. So I had a lot of confidence that this third party movement could go a long way. And, and we had the advantage of seeing the West is getting bigger, stronger, more people, bigger contribution to the GDP than ever before. That uh, for us to do this was a lot easier than those people that tried to start a new party in the depression. So I, I, I had a lot of confidence that we were, uh, history was on our side. <laughs> I think, and this has never been fully appreciated in, in central Canada, but you had the makings of a full-blown Western separatist movement at the time in the 1980s. There was this intense anger over the National Energy Program, the disillusionment with the conservatives, and, and you started to have these embryonic separatist parties. The separatist party elected a member to the Alberta legislature. This was not a, a, a joke. A, and the arguments that could be used against separatism in Quebec, that it did not make economic sense, or you'll pay a terrible economic price if you do, those arguments did not work in the West, because the advocates of secession would, could make the case that the West would be better off, at least in the short run, economically. And so there, how do you deal with a populist uprising uh, that's, and this is a very relevant question today, populism, uh, how do you deal with that? I, I, I take a, a neutral view with respect to populism itself, that this is bottom-up expression of democratic representation. It's got a potential for going the wrong way and being extremely dangerous, but it's got a potential for good. And what the reform did was take that sentiment 
And uh, we, we, we use the analogy of, in the oil patch of how, how do you tame a wildcat well? Like in, a, in a, a wildcat well, there's this enormous pressure coming from the bottom, and there's an enormous amount of energy there, positive energy that if you could ever harness it, it's great stuff. But uh, it can be extremely dangerous. It can, can go on fire, and then you've got a real problem. One of the ways of dealing with a, a rogue well is to drill in a relief well from the side, and the angle has to be right. If the angle's too shallow, uh, it, it won't take the pressure off. If it's too deep, the, the, the relief well can become a rogue well. But if you hit it right, you can take the pressure off and start to control that with valves and bring the well under control. And I liken the reform party to a relief well that tapped into that, uh, that negative protest sentiment. And, and we agreed with a lot of it. We said, you've got a right to be mad. You've got a right to be protesting and saying Confederation's not working for us. But rather than kick the whole thing apart, like the Bloc Quebecois, why don't we try to reform it to better reflect the Western interests? And, and uh, I, I think a reform is that kind of relief well. That, and if it hadn't have been drilled, you might have had a full-blown uh, separatist movement in the West at the same time that you had a separatist movement in Quebec. And that, that could have torn the country apart. There was a 1997 election, and, and we got a few more seats, became the official opposition, but the vote splitting was still a problem. So now you've had vote splitting in 1993 that handed things over to the Liberals, had vote splitting in 1997 that handed it over to them. And I was starting to get worried that w people get disillusioned, particularly at the grassroots level. What's the point of fighting these election campaigns and getting more votes collectively than the other guys but losing the seat? And uh, so th this, we, we raised the question with the reform membership. And it was very important that this be done incrementally. We didn't say, let's go and join the PCs. We said, let's, can we set up a committee to investigate if there's some common ground between ourselves and some of these other uh, conservative-oriented uh, people? And then we had, a refer we had a report, we had a referendum among our members. Do you want us to go the next step? Uh, we had several conferences, what would be the principal ground, what would be the policy ground of a new entity. And, uh, but the, the effort was being made to try and create a bigger thing and bring the, the uh, parties together. And uh, I think because it proceeded incrementally like that, you had a bit, I think this is a characteristic of dealing with Canadians anyway, on any big change, policy change or even political realignment. If you want them to go from A to C, you better show them B which is a step in the right direction, but it's not the whole jump. And uh, that process eventually produced the, uh, the uh, Canadian Alliance as the next iteration of reform, but involved reform and progressive conservative. We could not make any yards with the federal conservatives, particularly as long as Joe Clark was the leader. Joe jo was opposed to this. Joe jo and I had had this kind of discussion <laughs> way back when we were students at the University of Alberta. Joe was committed to the federal conservatives, and uh, and he, he he acknowledged that there were things wrong with the conservative. No party is perfect, but his idea was you work within it to try to change it, and and he would tell me that's the way you should do it. And I said, well, you can do that, but I actually think the West's going to produce something new someday. <laughs> Took 20 years to happen, so I'll go that route. But, uh, but we're, when we had reform, where we were starting to get sympathy from progressive conservatives was at the provincial level, not the federal level. The Philman conservatives in Manitoba, who were tired of this vote splitting, and, and saw us as a better vehicle for Western concern. The, uh, the Harris conservatives, Mike Harris in Ontario, was more sympathetic to us than he was to the federal conservatives, and eventually Ralph Klein here in Alberta. So the alliance was really an alliance between federal reformers, a few federal, more federal conservatives, but a lot of provincial conservatives, particularly in Manitoba, uh, Ontario, and Alberta. And uh, you now got this, the next iteration of reform is now the Canadian uh, alliance. Well, I, th I think you'd have had the continued vote splitting, and I, and I think we uh, reform would eventually have declined. I was getting concerned that we were losing more people off the back end of the wagon than that we could pull on the front. And, and it wasn't because they disagreed, it's just that they were disappointed that you couldn't get anywhere. All the net effect of all this was to elect uh, uh, liberals. So I, I think there would have been a, a decline, a, a, as occurred with the previous Western attempts to create national parties. Uh, 
Uh, another phenomenon that might have occurred is people might have turned to the provincial arena. This is what really happened to the CCF and to social credit. Their best people, they first they took a crack at the federal, but it was hard and not successful. So their best people started to go provincial. And so the federal party got weaker while the provincial expressions of that got. To, uh, we, we tried to keep reform out of the provincial arena. This was uh, our uh, appeal to Klein and to, to Philman and to Mike Harris. We, we'll stay out of the provincial arena, but you guys help us at the federal arena. So, uh, so the alliance was another step in the process. And of course, I, I lost the leadership in the process of that. The, the only way we could convince the other conservatives that this was a genuine effort, like because reform initiated, it looked like, no, no, what all this is, it's just a takeover attempt by reform. And the only way we could blunt that is say, okay, well, no, we'll put the leadership up and we encouraged a, a progressive conservative from Alberta, Stock Day, to contest it and, and encouraged uh, Tom Long. As a, a uh, prominent conservative in Ontario to contest it, and uh, uh, but, but it, the thing did come together, and uh, uh, the, the joke we had was that the operation was a success, but the doctor died. <laughs> Whether this phenomena is being engineered from the top by establishment people, and let's have a convention, but it's all controlled, or, or, or whether the thing is actually coming up from the, the bottom. I think that's the test of whether it's a democratic exercise or a authoritarian exercise dressed up in, in democratic uh, clothing. And, and because of the nature of the Reform Party, because of the nature of Western Canadian politics, our, ours had to be basically a bottom-up phenomenon. These leadership contests were a, a, a consequence and a culmination of desires coming up from the bottom. It wasn't just a five people in a room scheming how to get a hold of 24 Sussex Drive. So I think there was a democratic populist uh, dimension to all of those conferences, uh, including the leadership concert, uh, contest. The, the, the other aspect, and this is particularly challenging, Canada, because of the size and diversity of the country, was uh, the, the political parties are coalitions. They're, they're not homogeneous, and like everybody agreeing on everything. And a lot of the challenge at these conferences and conventions is the, uh, the reconciliation of conflicting interests, even within the conservative camp. For, for example, um, at one of our later conferences, we, we had a panel discussion where we asked a representative from each part of the country to define what's the distinguishing characteristic of conservatism in your part of the country. So the fellow from Atlantic Canada got up and said, tradition. That's the distinguishing characteristic of conservatism in Atlantic Canada. The Quebec representative said soft nationalism. The Ontario one, who was from downtown Toronto, said hierarchy and order. The fellow from the prairies, which was Link Byfield, one of the prairie fellows, said revolution. <laughs> and the BC representative said uh, polarization and being at the right end of the pole. Now, all of these people profess to be conservatives, but you have everything from tradition to revolution to hierarchy and order to polarization all within the same group. And, and so the challenge for the leadership but the challenge for the uh, executive of the party is how, how do you reconcile those? Can you find common ground among those people? And uh, the, the reason I, I think that's so important is recognize the, uh, the, the coalition building aspects of, of any political party and the reconciliation of conflicting interests is if you ever get into government, that's your number one job, is reconciling conflicting interests, particularly in this country. And if you can't do it within your own group, uh, why is the public going to believe that you can do that at the national level as a government? So I think this whole reconciliation effort that reform had to go through, the alliance had to go through, was as uh, putting people in, in a good position to uh, eventually actually be a, a governing party as distinct from just representing some faction of the body politic. I, I knew Peter, we, we were in the House together, and although I never had uh, much discussion with him on this subject, I felt he was much more amenable to reorganizing conservatism than my old friend Joe Clark, so that he, Peter becoming the leader, I, I personally thought there was a better potential for this. And I think what eventually happened, whether this happened literally or figuratively, 
the, the pollsters had a lot to do with um, Peter and, and Stephen uh, uh, eventually getting together. The pollsters could say to, to Peter, they could hang him over the edge of the cliff and say, you can keep this progressive conservative thing exactly as it is and it will end up being a rump party in Atlantic Canada. Now, if you're satisfied with that, that's the route to go. And, and it could be said to, to Stephen at the same time, you, you could keep this alliance thing. It's got a very strong Western base. The West is growing faster and going to be a more powerful part of the country, but, but it will be a rump party. It'll be a bigger rump than Peter's rump, but it'll still be a rump. No, and and th those are the options. If you want to be a governing party, uh, both, the, the potential is there for that too. And I think that logic, whether it actually came through pollsters or, or however it came about, I think that logic eventually dawned on, on Peter. And, and I think Steve, Stephen had the objective of creating a governing party right from the get-go. And, and to Peter's credit, he ended up putting his leadership on the line uh, and lost. Uh, but uh, again, it, it created this new Conservative Party of Canada, which formed a minority government and a majority government for nine years. From what I knew of Peter from being in, in the House, he, he was never as antagonistic to reform or saw reform as an outside threat. I think it's partly he's from Atlantic Canada. Atlantic Canada felt alienated too. You know, I think he could identify with some of the sentiment, if not the policies that we were advocating. So, uh, uh, and if the aim, and our aim, even when reform started, was to create a governing party. We had this, 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 this the aim is not just to be opposition. It's not just a protest. It's not just to object to what the other people are doing. It's to create a governing party, which means you got to get 150, in our day, 155 plus seats in that parliament. If we can't get that, we can't be a governing party. We can't do any of this stuff that we're talking about. And I think that logic eventually came through. Th this new Conservative Party was particularly committed to the fiscal responsibility and we, we, that was our biggest criticism of the Liberals. It's our biggest criticism of Liberals today that they do not have any inhibition about spending money, running deficits and running debts. And it often ends up being Conservative type people, whether they go under that label or not, who have to clean up the fiscal mess after a, a Liberal or a, an NDP administration. So. I, I saw the new Conservative Party as being strongly committed on that uh, front. I, I saw it as the, the West's influence over it and the leadership of it was, a lot of it was Western based, so we weren't losing, the, the, the West wanted in while the West was getting in with influence and power, so I didn't think we were losing that. The, the one front that I, I did worry about was the democratic bottom-up grassroots aspect of reform that that tended to be foreign to Ontario, foreign to uh, uh, Atlantic Canada, and whether that would suffer. But um, at that time, we didn't know. I tried. I made every effort to try to become the leader of the alliance. I didn't just say, "Well, we're, we'll fall on our sword in order to get these groups together." I made a major effort to become the leader of it, and I think Peter made a major effort. He wanted to be the leader of the whole thing. But uh, he, uh, he settled for not getting there, but bringing the party uh, together and ended up being a senior minister in the, in the government. And uh, I think that was to his, uh, his credit. This is almost a theological position. Self-sacrifice is an aspect of reconciliation. That's actually a theological concept. <laughs> not that anyone wants to do it, but certain things have to be sacrificed in order to get these groups together. You, you can sacrifice the principles of it, which is one, another road to go. So, well, let's just keep watering it down, watering it down until we got some kind of pragmatic soup. I, I would argue that the Federal Liberal Party tends to <laughs> do that. But uh, the, the other approach is for some people to sacrifice their positions or their career aspirations in order to get the thing together. And I think uh, that was the thing that uh, Peter did. Is that something you and Peter have in common? Yeah, maybe a little bit. We never talked about it. <laughs> the fact that the, the first Conservative Party of Canada government was a minority government was, I think, was un unfortunate because I think that's where the democratic aspects of the platform got um, couldn't be implemented. Like re reform had a 
we, we allowed a lot of freer, free votes, members do what you want. If you could prove that your constituents wanted that, it doesn't matter what you want, it's what your constituents want. But in a, and, and so we had members voting, you know, split votes in the House because we were pasted by the media and by the opposition as reform divided. When we said when you have free votes, that's exactly what you're going to have. People are going to vote, they're not going to vote always as a block on everything. Uh, but in a minority government, of course, if you've got one or two members that go offside, you can pull down the government. So there was a, a discipline that had to be uh, introduced at that time that, that was not conducive to that freer form that reform had. But uh, th then eventually, of course, if a majority government was formed. But uh, uh, that first stage was a minority government, which was a little awesome. more difficult, yeah. It's so hard to generalize on these things, but uh, I, I think uh, if you say there were three major things we wanted to achieve in the early days, one was to have a, a federal party with a strong, more vigorous Western voice. We got that. We wanted to have introduced fiscal responsibility into the federal arena in a way that it hadn't been introduced for a long time, and I think we had that. I think the one aspect of the reform thing that, that did not blossom uh, as much was the democratic uh, reform aspect. Now, to their credit, the federal conservatives, the one big democratic thing that they did, Mr. Harper endeavored to pursue and, and used up political capital on was to reform the Senate. And that was a big part of the, again, the reform argument. How come we got an unelected body having anything to do with the making the laws? in this country and we had this triple E Senate, it should be elected, it should be effective and it should have equal representation from each region. And uh, to be fair, the federal conservatives put together a bill, the first time it had ever been done to actually try to move in that direction. It was stymied basically by the Trudeau constitution and the way the courts interpreted it. But uh, the, that was a democratic initiative that you can't blame the Conservative Party of Canada for not achieving it. They did everything they could to achieve it until it got stalled by the court. I've never quite liked the phrase unite the, the right, partly because I think uh, this old axis of uh, that you can describe all the politics by left, center and right is uh, increasingly obsolete and just doesn't describe the political reality. Uh, and this is particularly true with millennials. Uh, we, we've, through the Manning Center here, d done a, a large uh, survey of millennials, a, sa a national sample of about 2,200 people. And one of the questions on it was, where would you position yourself on this left, center, right axis? And one of the major responses to that was, we don't like the axis. That doesn't describe how we see political reality. It doesn't describe our options or our choices. If you force us to put ourselves on there, uh, more of us will put ourselves in the center and the left than we will on the, uh, on the right. Or, or, and when you ask them what's the center position, they say it's just a default, an empty default position. It's neither left nor right, so stay in the same thing. We don't like the act. <laughs> so we've experimented with, uh, and I think this is a challenge for all the political parties, and we particularly present it to the conservatives, is to redefine political space so that millennials will be more comfortable and, and active in it. And, and, and this is a political necessity because uh, we define millennials as being from 16 years old to 35 because a 16 year old could vote in the next election. Uh, they, they, if they voted, they'd be the biggest voting bloc in the next federal election, the next Alberta election. And so we've been saying, okay, if you don't like that axis, is there some other axis that will define political space for you? And we've got about 10 of them, 12 of these. We've got a democratic axis. Say, uh, are you, uh, do, do you like bottom-up decision-making by large numbers of people, or do you prefer uh, more executive, expert decision-making coming from the top down? Where are you on that axis? Uh, we, we have an economic axis. Do you, do you favor an economy where the, the government is a big player and involves itself in investment and, and government enterprise and so forth, or do you prefer one where there's market uh, uh, mechanisms and, and entrepreneurship is the main engine, who do you trust? So there's a trust axis. Do you trust the big, the big entities, big government, big companies, big unions, or do you trust, you know, it's interesting on the survey, is that we trust ourselves, our family, our friends, um, maybe some NGOs, like they're quite a, 
a difference. And, we, and we're trying to redefine political space in such a way that millennials can see it as more relevant to where they are at and, and can see solutions to some of the public problems uh, by, by redefining that political space. And, and I think the political party that uh, does that properly is going to be best positioned for the 21st century. Well, I, I, th I think that's a big part of the, the next evolutionary uh, change. And, and t to me, it has echoes even of what we did in 1987. The, the media characterized this reform thing as a right-wing thing. But Western alienation, see, like, it doesn't fit on that left-right-center spectrum either. You had people that were alienated. You had liberals. That, uh, one of the prominent r supporters of reform financially in the beginning was Francis Winspear, a lifelong liberal in, in uh, Edmonton. We, we, the first meeting we held in Port Alberni on Vancouver Island was in the Union Hall. Well, these were old CCF people, not, but not, they were more Democrats, small d Democrats, than they were socialists, but they, they saw in reform, in this bottom-up thing, they saw echoes of the CCF. We, we won all the seats except one on Vancouver Island. So e even in the beginning, re reform was, it wasn't just a left-right center, it wasn't just a right-wing phenomenon, it was cutting through the spectrum in a different way, and that, uh, the regional dimension of Western alienation. So in a sense, this trying to redefine political space now for millennials is a little bit like that uh, uh, and, uh, and and I, and I think there's a lot can be learned from the reform experience that will be relevant to this next stage and to the younger people and the leaders that have to take it there. I think wh whereas the alternative when uh, back in the 80s was a separatist movement, I, I think the big danger for millennials is just complete alienation from the political process, this disengage and just saying we, we, we can't relate to whatever that is so we, we, we won't be involved in it and, and I think that's the, the biggest uh, danger and, and that uh, for the sake of coming back to the theme of representative democracy uh, you, you've got to have people participating in this system if they don't participate in it uh, the democracy simply doesn't work it turns into oligarchy or something worse. So I, I think the alternative to, to not engaging millennials is they're just they're increasingly d d disengaged. And then the one thing, we have receptions here for uh, a lot of millennials. I, I usually end up by saying or say at the beginning, if you choose to not involve yourself in the politics of your community or your province or your country, you will be governed by those who do. There are people out there who will get involved. And if you don't like what they're saying, if you don't like the framework that they're offering, you then get involved and change it. And, and if there's one sort of inspirational aspect uh, democratically from uh, the reform experience, and uh, Amer Americans who look at this actually comment on that, that uh, a small group of people, the, the first meeting to plan this meeting in Vancouver with five people in a room here in Calgary, a, a small group of people can take, uh, in Canada, despite all the flaws, and I've been a critic of the democratic uh, system as, as vigorous as anybody, but despite all the flaws, a small group of people in this country can still take the basic tools that democracy gives to everybody, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to try to persuade you to do this instead of that, or vote this way instead of that, and can change the system. Not, not as much as you would like it, never as far and exactly the way you would like, but you can change the system. You can change the nature of the government of Canada. You can change the nature of your provincial government. And, and, and regardless of whether you support what reform actually stood for, whether the policies or principles, uh, I, I think if you're a small d Democrat, th there, there should be encouragement and inspiration in that story. Uh, and hopefully some of that can be communicated to these millennials. They can, you can change the system, but you have to get involved.